Welcome to the Buker and Friends podcast. Here is your host. Let's send it over to Rick Buker. Rick Buker. Welcome to another episode of Buker Friendless, subsidiary of Buker and Friends, part of the United Wecast Network. I'm Rick Buker. You can see me on FS1. You can read me on Bleacher Report, and you can follow me on Twitter at Rick Buker. R I C B U C H E R. Now, before we get started, I have to make note of the fact that I listened to one of my recent Buker Friendless episodes. And maybe you've already noticed the distinction, the difference, but I didn't realize at the time how low key I sounded, mellow, if you will. Now, I've treated podcasts different than I did radio, even when I'm doing it with Will or Ryan. Uh, but having lots of energy was always a big thing with the producers on radio. And I also got the sense that my New York producers and programming directors had this built in prejudice that. Anyone from California, especially doing a show in California, was, you know, a laid back surfer dude. And me being a surfer dude in my downtime and them knowing that probably didn't help with that suspicion. No matter how I approached the show or how much energy or whether I was, whatever I was doing. But I've always looked at podcasts as different, it's a little more nuanced, it's more of a conversation, even when I'm doing it solo. So, This is what I'm curious to hear from all of you about. Do you prefer my BBC slash NPR slash golf channel demeanor? Or would you prefer if I bumped it up? Do you want do you want Christopher Bad Dog Russo? Or do you want Jim Nance? I'm not talking about content here uh, or voice or approach. I'm just, you know, tone. Let's (laughs) let's put it on that. Uh, Look, I can do it. Either way, I just might need to plan on recording at times of the day when I'm a little more juiced, if you know what I mean. And generally, we've been recording these in the evening, sometimes late in the evening, in order to be as up to date as we can be on the happenings in the sports world and to make our respective schedules mesh, since Will, Ryan, and myself all have other things that we have uh, that we're doing uh, besides this this podcast. So, anyway. If you feel strongly, one way or the other, uh, hit us up at Buker Friends on Twitter or Instagram and let us know. Speaking of news of the day, this is actually from a couple days ago, but you may have seen the piece I wrote this week about all the max player contracts handed out in the NBA this season in free agency and how in a survey of executives, not a single one of the 10 players who were paid as much as the offering team could possibly pay them. And the reason I'm phrasing it that way is the wording gets a little tricky because the player's original team can offer them the most. So these guys weren't always taking the most possible money that they can make. But in, I believe, all of those 10 cases, just about, the players took as much as they possibly could from the team that they ultimately went to. Uh, I believe... Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving might have taken a little less from Brooklyn, but that was only because they wanted DeAndre Jordan signed as well. So they had the choice. They decided to defer a little bit of their their cash to a buddy that they wanted on the team. And by the way, that subject, all of that, is going to be part of the next Buker Friend List, which we will release, uh, I believe, this weekend. But that is going to be the subject about players now controlling and basically building teams and the trouble, the potential trouble that lies ahead in the league moving in that direction. Now, back to this, uh, the max players and the contracts that were signed just in the last few weeks. Owners are the ridiculously rich people they are because their whole ambition is to make as much as they possibly can. This is my experience. I'm I'm just speaking from what I know in my interactions with them. They're a different breed. It's people making the kind of money that owners of professional franchises have made in the current era, in the modern era, are they're just they're cut a little bit different. And it's not about the sport. They they might tell you that they might a long fan, whatever. Da da da. Nah, it's about the money. And while they might be rich and have made a lot, plenty for them is still not enough. 
And what I've come to learn about NBA players is that they're just, they aren't the same way. They're not cut from the same cloth. Or at least they haven't been since Kobe Bryant retired. Kobe, if you remember, was not taking any discounts. And he took some grief from fans for that. People were suggesting that he undermined the Lakers because he refused to give a hometown discount. Well, I never, never uh, criticized Kobe for that. Never felt he was wrong in doing that because I knew that he knew how much the Lakers in particular and NBA owners in general were making off owning teams and he was going to be damned if he'd give them a handout or a discount. Owners, by the way, and I'm sure you know this on some level, but I get the sense that there's a lot of fans that don't really embrace it. The reason that there's a salary cap, the reason reason there are limitations on how much the players make is because the owners decided to make it so. They've already rigged the game by putting an artificial ceiling on how much they or their colleagues can spend in any one year, which thereby puts an artificial ceiling on what players can make in any one year. There is no other business that I can think of in the United States that works that way. There are no such ceilings for the owners or in any other business in America, let's say outside of sports. Even LeBron James, whose stated goal was to become the first billion-dollar athlete, put a limit on himself. Why a billion? You think Mark Cuban put a, a, a limit on himself? No. He doesn't think that way. I've yet to meet a modern-day owner who does. Now, if there is one, it's probably Herb Simon of the Pacers, but he's really not a modern day. He's an old schooler. He immediately comes to mind because of the sweetheart deal he did with the Bucks just recently so that they wouldn't be left empty-handed by the Pacers luring away Malcolm Brogdon. They were going to give Malcolm Brogdon an offer sheet. And they knew once the Bucks had signed Chris Middleton to a max deal that the Bucks, the small market Bucks, were... Not, I'm not going to say they couldn't afford it. I'm going to say they weren't willing to try to afford it. The Pacers and Herb decided that instead of an offer sheet, and they could have given him Brogdon an offer sheet so lucrative and chock full of expensive, expensive provisions and clauses that the Bucks would not have matched it. And because they they could. I mean, you put an offer sheet out there, Brogdon's restricted. The Bucs could match anything that the Pacers put out there. But Pacers knew that they could make it big enough, challenging enough, that the Bucs would not. But Simon didn't do that. Instead, he had Kevin Pritchard, Pritchard agree to a sign-and-trade deal with the Bucs, and they gave Milwaukee a couple of second-round picks in exchange for sending them Brogdon on a three-year, $85 million deal. $84, $85 million, if I'm not mistaken. Now, keep in mind, Herb is still a savvy businessman. He wasn't being completely magnanimous in doing this. Because if he offers a contract with all sorts of financial booby traps and poison pills, and the Bucks don't match, it's not like you can rewrite that contract. He now has to sign Brogdon to the offer sheet as written. And now, the Pacers have ownership of that same contract with all the financial booby traps and poison pills. And maybe you wouldn't worry about that if it was a superstar, if it was Kawhi Leonard, if it was Paul George, player of that ilk. But Brogdon isn't exactly that kind of a player. You don't assume he will be with your franchise forever or even through the next three years. Pacers had Mike Conley first on their list, but the Jazz beat them to him. And by the way, how do I know that? Because I was standing there at the NBA Awards down in Santa Monica when Pacers GM uh, Pritchard, Kevin Pritchard, needled Jazz GM Dennis Lindsay for doing exactly that. It's amazing what, if you're just hanging out, the things that you hear in conversation. So maybe even Herb Simon doesn't qualify as... Uh, as anything other than an avaricious owner. Although, as one of the remaining members of the old guard of NBA owners, as I've said, he, he probably comes closest. All of this is why I'm not as militant as I once was 
about waving the flag that any fan who sides with the owners over the players in a labor dispute must either be some kind of sheep or full of self-loathing because the players have far more in common with the average fan than the average fan has with an owner. That's just the reality. And I don't get the sense that fans really understand that. And I believe the reason is because fans look at owners and they're more likely to look like them than any player. And uh, I'm not going to get political, but we are very much a judge the book by its cover society. It's if they look like me, if they talk like me, they must look, they must be like me. And that just ain't true. Now, uh, I'm not as militant because if the players aren't willing to fight for every dollar they have coming to them, why should I? <laughs> I, and I don't even really blame the players for not trying to get every last dollar. There was a time where I did, and there is, we've seen it with the, the, the situation that Chris Paul is in now and some of the backbiting that we're hearing from the middle-class players, and this has long been an issue. I don't know that there's a resolution, but when Chris Paul and LeBron James and some of the stars in the league stepped up and said, we're going to run the NBA Players Association, and everybody, again, I feel like fans applauded. Isn't it great? These guys care. Yeah. They rigged the system in their favor. That's why they cared. They set the rules. They negotiated rules that benefited the upper class. And I hate to say it, but it sounds kind of familiar. Now, again, I'm not going to get political. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Sounds very familiar. The middle class players, there's no question, the middle class players have been hurt by the current salary structure and and salary cap rules. And I would imagine it's going to continue in that direction. Some of it is just the market. The superstars make the most money. And so that they would, uh, they generate the most money, so they should receive the most money. That's capitalism and that seems on the face of it fair to me. But... You have to look at it in another prism too because this is not typical capitalism. As I mentioned, there are artificial rules in place because sports are viewed as being different. And and that's why for all of you out there who continue to compare your jobs to what athletes do and uh, grouse about the fact that they get paid to play a game, look, it's a whole different universe. You can't compare the rules that you have to live by and work by to the ones that they do. It's a different animal. And there's pluses and minuses to that. Maybe we'll get to get back to that uh, at some point. But the bottom line is that the rules are different for owners. And so I believe for the health of the sport, the rules can be different for the players. And that having a better distribution of wealth among the players appreciating the middle class would be good for the league just as it would be I would say for society again not getting political just making an observation but look I'm not uh, I'm not going to fight that fight anymore I might raise it I might explain it but I'm not going to go to the wall with it. I'm not going to get called into Commissioner David Stern's or the Commissioner's office as I was with, with David Stern once upon a time when I was with the Washington Post, for basically doing that. Because I made the point, everybody's calling this a strike back then. So it wasn't a, st- a strike. It was a, uh, a work stoppage. And it was fomented by the owners. David didn't like that at the time. Because they really had everybody believing that the players were uh, bad guys for suggesting that they deserved more or better. In any event... Players have gotten to a point now, at least the, the the top ones, where it's just not in their DNA. They're, they're already making hundreds of millions. It's more than they ever dreamed of. So they're not trying to get every dollar. They're looking for some of the ancillary benefits that they can get. And I look, it's just, it's not how they were raised 
or what the be all and end all of playing basketball in the first place was all about. What, well, yeah, I'm, there's plenty of guys who play and have played because of what the game can bring them. But they didn't set out for it to get them everything, a specific number. It was, let me make more than I could possibly dream of making doing anything else. And they are achieving that. And then some. So, the ones that are capable of demanding every last dollar simply aren't. We, we're not seeing that anymore. There, there are other guys that, uh, look, they're, they're not getting the, uh, the pot at the end of the rainbow where they are secure for the rest of their lives. They still have to, if they can get a couple million more, they're going to fight for it. But the guys at the top, the superstars, they were raised to care about points and statistics and trophies far more than dollars in the bank account. That was never, that was never, and even now, is not how players gauge each other. Do they want the max? Yes. They want the the title of being a max player or a super max player. But based on where they are, it doesn't mean that bottom line, they're going to make the most dollars. It's just the way the system is set up. And by the way, I don't think they're wrong about keeping score with accomplishments in the game. Here's a list of people. This is just uh, why I believe that and why you should too. Here's a li- and I believe that you do on some level. Here's a list of people, and you tell me if you ever heard of any of them. Bernard Sherman, Henry Hillman, Leandro Rizzuto, John Huntsman, Samuel Newhouse. Any guesses? Clues? You give up? They were all once among the richest men in the world, all billionaires who died in the last few years. Now, tell me if you recognize these names. Bart Starr, Frank Robinson, King Kong Bundy, John Havlicek, Bill Buckner. Yeah, they all died recently too. You're probably well aware of that. As I told Jason Whitlock on Speak for Yourself a couple of weeks ago, it's not what you have, and I forget what the subject was. Oh, I think it was, should uh, should young black men revere Jay-Z? And I think he had just become a billionaire. He had, he had some, some financial plateau. And it was, uh, it was a, the question of the day, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And I said at the time, it's not what you have that makes you famous or memorable or legendary. It's what you do. Not what you have. It's what you do. And look, I'm sure all of those rich guys did some notable things, some honorable things. I would venture to guess. Might have been part of a tax shelter or write-off, but nonetheless, I'm sure that they all did uh, certain good things for society. We just don't remember them for that. It was, none of it was big enough for us to remember them for that. And their money, did it make them memorable? Well, I don't. I had never... John Huntsman, because if I'm not mistaken, and I'd have to look it up, I believe his son was running for, for president uh, for a short time and is now the ambassador, is an ambassador overseas. Don't know off the top of my head which country, but... That's the only name that I recognized. And certainly, that's not, we're not talking about the same guy. So, and I don't know for a fact they're related, I'm guessing. In any event, look, all those rich guys, they didn't do anything that impacted you or me in a way that touched us emotionally. They're having a lot of money doesn't change your life or mine or give us any sort of satisfaction. Now, LeBron, KD, Russ, Kawhi, love them or hate them, they've all done that for us, one way or the other. They've touched us emotionally. Good, bad, whatever. So, that's for me why players not trying to get every dime, I kind of get it, and I'm okay with it, at least now. 
All right, so back to the max contract story. The genesis of it was me asking a couple of GMs. I was just curious. Among all the potential max contract free agents, this is before I was assigned to actually write the piece for Bleacher Report. I was just asking, I said, of all these guys, how many are team leaders? And the reason I ask that is because I know that the formula for a championship team is that your best player has to be your hardest worker. Has to be. I've never seen a team win a championship. Now, the the ability of that player can be, he may not necessarily be your best, uh, like most talented, highest scorer, but the all-around best player has to be your hardest worker. And see, when we define that, I, I just kind of talked myself in circles there for a second because you can define best in a number of different ways. But when your best player is your hardest worker, on some level, he's going to lead you. Now, is he going to lead you in every possible way? Well, if he's making the most money, and so here's the distinction. When your best player is your hardest worker and he's making the most money, he's top at the top of your uh, payment, your, your player payroll pyramid, now you have a chance. But that leadership comes in a multitude of forms. He can't just be your leading scorer. He can't just be your go-to guy. And this is where I got from a, a former player who's now an executive, a guy that I respect immensely in both, uh, in both roles, laid it out. Because, look, there's, there's times where you get a GM or you get somebody who is a great uh, assessor of talent. And that's why they're in the front office. They can see it. And then you have players who can sense who can play and who can't. But they also have the awareness of how it works inside the locker room when you're in the mix of those players. You're in, you're in the, in the bullion bays of all the guys that are competing. I and mean, that's a little bit different. And so when he said, when the player said, look, I need a guy who's going to be the face of my franchise, who is, I can give him the ball at the end of the games and I'm comfortable. He's going to lead my franchise in the right direction on and off the court. He's going to uh, elevate the players around him. He's going to be vocal on some level. He's going to let his voice be heard. When he said all of those things, that that's what a max player really needs to be, then that kind of confirmed my thinking, which is unless your max player is your best player, your hardest worker, and, and the guy who's willing to be the face of your franchise, that is going to deal with the media, that is going to make appearance, all of those things, Anything short of that, that means you now have to have somebody else on your team and on your roster who's willing to do those things that normally go to the guy who makes the most money. And the instance you have somebody who's having to pick up the slack for somebody who's getting paid for those jobs, now you have a little bit of a conflict. Now you have a rub. Now you have what we like to call a workaround. It's not a perfect fit. You can make it fit, but you got to jimmy it a little bit. So I asked these GMs, looking at the guys that were getting max deals, and this was, I think, even before all of them were handed out. They just looked at the field of players that were available. And the answer was none. None are, none check every box. None are a perfect fit. Not in the purest sense. Now, I know, uh, not only will fans, may they say this, but have said it to me on social media, they look at a KD or a Kawhi and say, wait, they led their teams to championships. How can you say they're not leaders? To which I and the GMs I spoke with would say, are you really sure KD and Kawhi led their teammates? There's plenty of evidence that Steph Curry was, is, and continues to be the real leader of the Golden State Warriors. Kawhi 
Are you really sure? Or did he simply lead them in scoring? Or make the shot that won a series? Or step up big in certain instances? That's not the full breadth of being a leader. Those are indeed part of leading, but they're not everything. And sometimes they can even be deceiving. What doesn't show up in the box score or highlight clips are the guys who pull a team back in the line during a timeout or sit down next to a guy on the bus or pass along a message from the head coach that is going to have more impact from that player than it would the guy who's holding the clipboard. Now, the quote that got everybody's attention from my story was a GM saying that Kawhi doesn't elevate anyone. He doesn't rally a team. Well, I, look, I don't know how many Newt Rockney speeches Kawhi has had. I'm not sure that he's had any. And that's not the only way that you can rally a team. I, I, I pointed out, look, I, I got the sense that there was a confidence that the Raptors had because they had Kawhi, because they could hand him the ball in certain situations and he would just try to go get it, that uh, that, that was different. That was something that was a plus. You know who else had that demeanor? Fred Van Vliet had that demeanor. So, uh, anyway, people took issue. But he, Kawhi won a championship. He's won a championship with two different teams. How can you say he's not a leader? How can you say he doesn't elevate people? Well, I gave you a stat that I think is very telling. And if you watch the game and you know the game, you know that Kawhi is not a playmaker per se. He tries to get his. And if he can't, he will give it up. And he will often draw attention before he gives it up. But that pass that he makes is a concession. It's not setting somebody up. He's not a playmaker. He he averaged fewer assists in 30-some minutes than Jamal Crawford, who's not looking to make plays. I mean, he can. He's better passive than maybe giving credit for. But he's looking to score the ball. He averaged more assists in 19, 20 minutes with the Phoenix Suns than Kawhi Leonard did in 30 plus minutes with the Toronto Raptors, with all the scorers that they have. He's not a playmaker. So when the the GM says that he doesn't elevate anybody, that's what he means. And it's pretty damn accurate. That's not a knock on Kawhi. He's a great player. I'd give him a max contract. But that doesn't make the GM wrong in his statement. Now, did he do for the Raptors what they did not get from DeMar DeRozan in previous years? Sure. But as I said, you know who else had profound impacts, impacts at crucial times for the Raptors that they didn't have in previous years? Pascal Siakam, Fred Van Vliet, Marc Gasol. Even Serge Ibaka was better at times this past playoff run than I've ever seen him. So to suggest that Kawhi was the sole difference in the Raptors winning the East this year after falling short in every previous year is really ignoring both then and now. And the fact that there were games he struggled and Toronto still won. Or forgetting that LeBron James, who was the Raptors' biggest nemesis in previous years, happened to move west and and clear the road. I... A case could be made. You take LeBron out of the East and you keep the Raptors as is. Dwayne Casey, DeMar DeRozan, the whole kit. And they might have come out of the East. So, there's also some readers, Warriors fans I presume, who took issue with the idea that Golden State considered giving Klay Thompson less than a max salary. That was in my story too. Heard from a source that there's a couple of minority owners who kind of floated the idea. Hey, I wonder if, you know, maybe you think Clay would go for a little bit of a hometown discount? I mean, he has been part of something special and he's got the, and I think this was discussed even before the ACL injury, but the feeling like, hey, we've done as much for Clay as Clay has done for us. He's been part of something really big. And some fans, upon hearing that, were like, Clay Thompson, he deserves every penny of a max deal. Anybody who would suggest that they shouldn't give him a max deal, they need to be run out of here immediately. Okay, based on what? 
I mean, the max salary for Clay based on what? Because again, you're looking through the wrong end of the telescope. Nobody is a bigger proponent of what Clay has meant to the Warriors than me. But you don't pay guys based on what they've done for you, what they've already done for you. You pay them strictly on what you think they can do for you going forward. And if any fan base should know that, it's the Warriors fan base. Because you know who was the best at that? Bill Walsh. Bill Walsh, no matter how big a star was, the second he couldn't deliver commensurate with what he was getting paid or what he wanted to get paid, Bill Walsh was moving on. That's why Joe Montana didn't play his entire career in a 49ers uniform or Jerry Rice. Bill was cold-hearted that way. But you know what? It kept the 49ers chugging at a championship level. Now, the rules were a little bit different then, and still he held to that. This is different. This is now with a salary cap. If you want to remain a competitive team, and in the case of the Warriors, the expectation is that they be a lot more than just competitive, you're paying a price. By maxing out Clay, it very well could mean that Joe Lacob the owner, decides he can't afford to keep Draymond Green. So is Clay so good that combined with Steph Curry and a cast of role players that the Splash Brothers, just as a duo, can lead to a team uh, can lead a team to a title? I wouldn't bet on it even if Clay weren't coming back from a torn ACL. But he is. So signing Clay to a max severely ratchets down the Warriors' ability to add any significant pieces to their roster. That's just the reality. That's salary cap reality. Now, if him taking less facilitated maybe keeping Draymond, as we were told that KD did so that they could sign back Andre and Sean Livingston, wouldn't that be ideal? What's wrong with floating that idea? They didn't take it to the point where they ended up losing Clay, and under the circumstances, that's good. Yeah, look, you end up paying Clay to keep him. Okay, he gets the max. I'm not. I don't have a problem with that because it's not my team. But if you're taking issue with someone exploring that, it's actually smart to explore that because. You're taking care of Clay, and you're doing it very potentially at your own competitive expense. Suggesting the Warriors should have handed Clay a max contract and not thought twice about it is putting appreciation for past services ahead of future success. You're basically, if you are that kind of fan, you're saying, hey, look, pay the guy. I'm happy. We got, we won some championships. If we're not very good the next couple of years, or we're just competitive, or we never win another championship, I'm good with that. Because I just want Clay to get his reward. That's all I really care about. I don't care about the team being competitive going forward. And if Clay isn't that good, and he doesn't lead us to another championship, I promise that I'm never going to give him a hard time. I'm never going to say a bad word about that contract. Right. I want all of you to take that pledge right now. No, actually, I don't, because you're never going to be able to live up to it. Not if you're the kind of fan that thinks that they should have just blindly given Clay a max. They ended up giving him a max, but giving it to him blindly and thinking that to think anything else is silly, foolish, whatever, is really not thinking this through. And that's why I'm here. I'm here to help you think these things through. So that we can have this conversation here and you can hear this. And then when you're hanging out with your boys or you're at the bar or you want to pipe up on a radio show or whatever, you're not going to say something that ultimately is going to come back and embarrass you. That, that's what I'm here for. I want this to work for all of us. Look, the Bucks just went through this. Signing Chris Middleton, as I mentioned, to a max deal meant they couldn't afford to keep Brogdon in, in their scheme of things. Now, Here's the question, and it was because the same thing is going to be that the Clay is going to face. Can Middleton be everything he was last year as an all-star, first-time all-star, and make up for Brogdon's absence? Be everything he was and then some? The answer is no. Middleton was very good last season, 
except in the playoffs when Brogdon, when he wasn't hurt, was far more efficient, far more gutsy, far more clutch. And at 27, seven seasons into Middleton's career, he's in the prime. But I don't see him making some huge leap over the next two, three years. That generally happens with guys who have untapped athleticism and and find a way to refine it with newly developed skills. A Pascal Siakam is, a, is an example. And I just wouldn't put Middleton in that camp. I'm not going to put D'Angelo Russell, for that matter. For those of you who think that last season was just the beginning for him, I'm not putting him in that camp. There's nothing against D'Angelo. I'm glad that that he's proved that he's he's not a bust. I'm proved that he's grown up at least enough that he's not outing teammates, unbeknownst to them, to their girlfriends, to their celebrity, wealthy, uh, I don't know. I don't know how tight Nick Young was. But with uh, with Ziggy, but uh, nonetheless, cost him, cost him a relationship. That's not cool. He, he was better with the Nets. For those, those of you who think he was a completely different guy, slow your roll. There's evidence that suggests otherwise. And you don't have a, a evidence that suggests that he was. And don't give me what his teammates were saying or what Jared Dudley was saying. They wanted, they wanted D'Angelo to grow. So they knew coming down on him hard wasn't the way to go. It was, let's encourage him. Let's, let's keep patting him on the back. Let's keep him... To keep him on the farm. That was the approach. And that's why you have to interpret what they were saying with uh, certain glasses, let's say. All right. So, um, look, D'Angelo's decision making, it can improve for sure. And that would make him a better player. But I just don't see where he's going to become significantly better. Is he going to suddenly become a lockdown defender? I mean, I suppose he could. Is he going to see the floor better and don't bring up his seven assists? Please do not bring up his seven assists that he averaged last year. He's a ball-dominant guy. I've seen plenty of guys who, I mean, Russ Westbrook averages a lot of assists. It's, is he seeing the floor and all of that? No, he just has the ball in his hands a lot. I mean, let's be real. That's what D'Angelo had last year. He had the ball in his hands a lot. He's not going to have the ball in his hands as much with the Warriors, presumably, playing with Steph and Draymond, both of whom are better playmakers and passers. So, look, if D'Angelo strings together 10, 12 seasons like the last one, that would be a really solid career. I don't know he's going to be an all-star in all those. I don't know if he's going to be an all-star again, to be honest with you, but... If he could play like he did last year, that level of efficiency and find a way to do it, maybe not dominating the ball quite as much, that'd be be a really nice career. And I hope he has that. But we're going to find out real quick just how versatile he is because the Warriors, one, are offering ample opportunity, and two, they demand a level of attention to detail that D'Angelo hasn't always demonstrated. Kenny Atkinson was... Very good. He was a stickler. You know what Kenny Atkinson did? He sat D'Angelo for long stretches at times, including in the fourth quarter. Just the way it worked. And they made it work for the Nets in the Eastern Conference, winning a couple games over 500. Expectations with the Warriors, the kind of players they have, even dinged up as they are, a lot different. Western Conference, way different. We'll see. We'll see if uh, D'Angelo is up to the challenge. And all this that I'm saying about D'Angelo and Middleton, look, I feel the same way about Fred Van Vliet. Someone asked me the other day if I thought he, you know, if they they moved on from Kyle Lowry. Could he be a starting point guard? The suggestion was he could could step right in. He could be as good as Kyle, maybe even better. And yeah, he could be a starting point guard, but not necessarily a good one. Or a durable one. And I like Fred. But he's already having wear and tear issues as a backup. And when a player excels coming off the bench, that's not necessarily a signal that he should be a starter. It's a signal that he's in a role in which he can excel. Now, sometimes great backups are forced to be mediocre starters. But it's not by design. It's because the team doesn't have a better option. And 
I love how when a guy goes from a backup to a starter and then he doesn't have the same success, it's what? Somebody's fault? Coach isn't using them the right way? Starters, players around him aren't good enough? No. Sometimes he was in the, in, in the best role he could possibly be. And when you start to play against the A-listers from the start of a game and you have to manage everybody along with your own game, that's a whole different task than coming in off the bench and being a jump starter, as Van Vliet was. And he was good at it. But the, but the, the tone of the game, he could sit back, watch, and see, okay, this is what I need to do. Come in and do it for a burst. When you're a starting point guard, it's a whole different animal. Now look, I love watching guys like Van Vliet play. In particular, I mean, I love his game. I love everything about him. Love how he fought through the back injuries. Love how he came up with the big shots. I mean, coming off the bench and having the guts to do what he did. I love all that. And I love it because he's getting it done with his toughness and skill and understanding of the game. He's not overwhelming anybody physically. And truth be told, I have to be all that just to make the cut as a D1 soccer player at an Ivy League school at a time when we weren't very good. Which tells you I wasn't exactly brimming with athleticism. I had, I was a good athlete, but I had, for Division I, I had just enough to get on the field and then I had to maximize everything else at my disposal to be a good player. And I prided myself in that. And I admire guys who have had to do the same thing. In whatever sport, whatever job that they may be in. All right. That does it for this episode of Buker Friendless. Part of Buker and Friends and the United Wecast Network. Uh, Thank you all for reviewing the show. Leaving us uh, a review however many stars you want to give us and most of you are giving us five stars and we're very appreciative we're glad that you like the show we're always looking to make it better so if there's anything you think we can do please drop us a line and let us know and if you want to be eligible for some prizes then screenshot that review and send it to us at Buker Friends along with whatever tone, demeanor you'd like from me whether you want more guests we're We're a little bit of a hiatus here where we're only doing two, three shows a week through uh, the month of August, and then we'll ramp it up again once football gets started. So, or, or maybe not. I mean, if the three a week is really working for you guys, this is wide open. Uh, We love doing it. We appreciate the audience, but we also want to tailor this for, uh, we figured, look, you're listening to us. The beauty of the podcast is you get to listen to what you want to listen to when you want to listen to it. That's what I appreciate about this medium. So, with all that in mind, we want to make sure that you are listening to what, not just who, but what you want to be listening to. And your uh, advice, your suggestions, your input is always welcome. All right. That does it. In the next podcast, I am going to do another Buker Friendless for the weekend. And it will be all about this new turn. I'm going to tell you about the book that I sold and then was killed that forecast the last major turn in the NBA and how I see another turn coming. And I'm a little more scared about this one than I was the one that inspired me to write a book. All of that in the next podcast. In the meantime, as always, thanks for listening.